Hello, I'm Ellen Malfris, and I welcome you to watch a conversation that Pat Conroy and I had almost exactly five years ago. This was October 22nd, 2020. It was a giddy time for me. My novel, Untying the Moon, which you will hear Pat refer to hilariously in this little conversation, had just been released the week before. Conroy was there at my side for the book launch. The festivals the next week, we were busy as beavers. Jonathan Haupt doing, of course, the lion's share of everything, but also Catherine Seltzer and I, with all these plans involving all these people coming from all these places to participate in all these events, this three-day festival, this three-day gathering, October 29th, 30th, and 31st, and the Friday and Saturday of it, we were jam-packed with events, morning, noon, night, and later night receptions, and, and so many events. As I say, a giddy time for me. For Pat Conroy, typically, not so much. When you hear him say that he is dreading this hoopla, supposed hoopla, that he is not even convinced is going to amount to a hill of beans, he's, he's telling you the truth. There's something in Conroy, no matter what, that little voice lacking self-confidence sat there and spoke to him always. He, he was dreading it and he had no idea how it might turn out. I guess neither did we, but we had a better clue that it was going to be the great success that it, that it was. But so this was the week before. When the interview begins, um, Pat may seem slightly, if not flustered, let's just say less than perhaps comfortable. He was. He had come in much chagrined because he was quite late. <laughs> he had been uh, working out with Mina and forgot that he and I were going to have this little chat. And so Conroy does not like to disappoint. It, it bothers him to let feel like he's letting someone down. And so he, he came in all apologetic and it took him a few minutes to, to settle into himself. The conversation would have gone on longer. Um, we are certainly comfortable to sit and, and chat, he and I. And I had my whole list of questions that I really wanted to ask him, but it turned out to be a, a fairly free-flowing conversation where I basically set him up and, and let him do his, do his thing. It would have gone on longer except for the fact that because of his tardiness, we ended up running late to a reception at the Verdeer House in, in his honor and then onward to dinner at the Anchorage. So I, I, I cut it off course now wish that I hadn't but so sit back and enjoy you'll hear um, Pat talking about some fun childhood memories libraries and, and reading talking about what makes a good reader what makes a good writer talking about his writing life with Sandra Cassandra King Conroy about Story River books about James Dickey, we talk a lot about James Dickey, who was his teacher and my teacher and mentor. Also, um, and about the treasure box, a, a fun question that, that I enjoyed hearing him answer, and so will you. Um, listen to the very end of this, uh, when we say we're, we're done and um, Zach, who is filming, cuts things off. Wait until the, the last, thing. You will hear, you witness this, I think, several times in this interview, but Pat's discomfort with the notion of being loved. Pat Conroy was a man, that, that same little voice uh, who spoke to him of 
you know, reminding him not to have the confidence in himself that he surely earned. Um, that, that voice that said to him, you aren't worthy of love. That's, that's in great part his discomfort at this whole idea that we were making all this big to do about him, that somehow he wasn't worthy of it. And I'll tell you that, that Jonathan and I had several conversations about how involved Conroy might be in this thing, this, this long weekend of multiple events. And we thought he might, you know, make his cameo appearances where he needed to and at receptions. But in fact, it turned out that Pat was there essentially for the, the whole thing. He didn't miss much. And he was sitting there in the audience to the point that I began asking him on stage for the, the panels, and there were a number of them that I was moderating, participating in. And, and up he came, Pat Conroy, always the good sport for sure, became an integral part of not just the reason that we were doing this, but of the actual events themselves. And during the course of those events, when so many people from, from his past and publishing, fellow writers, um, the Hollywood types, um, everybody, his family from near and far, have all his daughters there, everybody there, and this joyous thing, this magical, joyous, wonderful thing, this, this vibe that all of us still remember oh so well and will never forget this, this feeling of, of love. Pat couldn't help himself. So that by the end of Saturday evening, before we headed to the armory for the big final blowout birthday bash, the last event when Catherine Seltzer was, was interviewing him on stage, by the time it was said and done, Pat Conroy was so moved, so joyous himself, so appreciative. There was no denying to this guy who somehow in that little part of him felt unworthy of love. There was no doubt that he was indeed worthy of that love. And when he stood there and poured out his heart to us all and expressed his gratitude and expressed his love to all of us there and to all of his readers. We couldn't have asked for more. I'm gonna stop now. I'm gonna let you watch this. Enjoy, enjoy Pat's humor. I think people that know Pat Conroy from his books alone don't realize his cleverness, his smartassery, his his sense of, of humor. So enjoy that as well. Bye. I'm Ellen Malfris here at the University of South Carolina Beaufort with Pat Conroy, where next week USCB will host a three-day conference and festival entitled Conroy at 70, a celebration of South Carolina's Prince of Titles. So Pat, next week throngs of people will arrive in Beaufort to pay tribute to Pat Conroy. Editors and agents and artists and writers and scholars and Hollywood types, not to mention family and friends and fans. What's that like for Pat Conroy? It's probably the greatest nightmare that has descended upon me in the later years of my life. I agreed to this, have no idea why I agreed to this, except I think I told you at your grand opening of your novel the other night that 
this whole thing, the celebration of my birthday, seems like a victory of human vanity over human modesty. And that is all I can say. And it's a theory that throngs of people are going to show up. We will see. Conway always has a dark side that thinks I will be sitting there at a celebration of my 70th birthday and I will be there and even my wife has decided not to come. My family members who have reason to be bitter at me, they decide not to come. You, who has no reason to be bitter to me, decides she has something better to do like, you know, buy work gloves at Sears or, you know, change her hand lotion. So I will see how this is, Ellen, but to look forward to it, no, that is not my way. I cannot look forward to anything in which I have to go around and being the star attraction. It causes me pain. Not sure we believe that. If you do not believe it, you do not know me as Ellen obviously does not. So here we are in these hallowed halls of education. Let's talk about learning. I know that there are two teachers who are particularly special to you. Gene Norris is one of them and James Dickey is another of them. Could you say something about each of those briefly and tell me maybe if there are others who have influenced you? You know, Gene Norris was a teacher when I came in Beaufort when I was 15 years old. Uh, I'd never been to a public high school. I'd only been to Catholic high schools, Catholic schools. And I walked in, as all good Catholic boys did, and I was standing beside my desk. And of course, the public school kids that I always heard were wild and sex-driven and out of their minds with, you know, lack of discipline. And I was sitting there and Mr. North saw me and he comes up to me and he says, what you doing, boy? You going crazy? Sit down. He pushed me down. And I did not know that was the beginning of one of the closest relationships of my life. And Gene, the first thing I wrote for Gene in his class was he put on the music Bolero. And he said, what does that make you think? And so I wrote this long thing of a, a gypsy encampment. I think I was under my Hemingway spell then. And there was a massacre at night. And anyway, he reads it and he comes back and he says, you're not nothing, are you, boy? You want to be something, don't you? He says, we'll see about you, boy. And you know, I was with Gene from that moment until the time he died. And <clears throat> I'm sorry, I did the eulogy at, at Gene's funeral. Uh, James Dickey, I was in love with his poetry and fell in love with his book of poetry, 57 to 67, which you have there. And I fell in love with him. The, while I was sitting on the porch of Tim Bell here on the point in Beaufort. And when I read his poems, it is, I thought I had come at last to the poet of my life, the poet who would speak to me most directly, uh, most passionately, would cause the most emotion just because of his genius was language, his choice of subject, and his all committed love of poetry itself which he calls in one of his um, in one of his poems I love the best the last Wolverine when he says oh God of the wildness of poetry and I and I just you know I just remember reading that book uh, and like you I was thunderstruck I was completely magically taken into a world of language I'd never been before and I was reading him last night before I came here today and always we remind each other of Dickey because he was such a great teacher. And I ended up giving his eulogy at his thing. It was one of the great honors of my entire life. Uh, I had two other English teachers, Joseph Monty from Gonzaga High School, Mill and Ellis from Beaufort. In high school, I had a murderer's row of these men who just were teaching they could make you fall in love with a writer just by talking about that writer or reading from their work that day. And I remember those people and all these guys were men. I went to these Catholic schools, these almost all male schools, the Citadel, 
Colonel Doyle and Colonel Carpenter. And I simply remember these men with joy and love and respect. And they taught me that teaching is the most honorable thing someone can do in their lives. And I was going to be a teacher my whole life, but it did not work out so well for me. You mentioned to the last Wolverine, the last Wolverine. Is that your favorite Dickie poem? No, there's no such thing as my favorite Dickie poem. There are, there are 25 of my favorite Dickie poems. I, I have them, I, I look through them and I end up reading the same ones. Um, I, you know, I keep going back to them. I, you just showed me a new book that's come out and I, I'm excited because I've never read these. And I remember when the collected works of Dickie came out, I just went crazy because there were so many new poems I'd never seen, uh, never heard of. And, but I have, there are 25 to me that seems to be in any anthology of world literature. They're that good. Uh, they, they move me that much and they still move me as much as the first one. Um, uh, you know, I have read The Lifeguard. Dickie used to say when there was something that he liked in his workshop classes, if there was material that he approved, he would say, that's the stuff. Yeah, I mean, he was, I, I had one um, good moment in his class, and I, I wrote something based on a poem he had written that I had loved, and that happens to me a lot, where the writers I love, I try to steal from and copy and uh, try to, you know, get exam. I mean, they inspired me. And, oh, that happened to Dickie, this happened to me. Um, that happened, and you know, I had something like that happen to me when I was in eighth grade. And, you know, I read to be inspired. You know, I read to be changed. And Dickie was so great at that. And I read a poem when I was in his class, and I was right, trying to write poetry for him, oh my God. It was, it, it was horrible. You know, what I gave him embarrasses me still today. I mean, I just, ugh. But I, that's, you know, I was younger and I wanted to learn and that's how you learn, you know, make mistakes. But one thing I wrote for him based on a poem he wrote called The Bee, in which one of his young sons, and I believe it was Kevin, I think I said Christopher in an article one day, I believe it was Kevin, uh, is stung by a bee and runs out, he's a little boy on a California highway into the traffic. And his father is chasing him. His father realizes he's getting older. So he calls one of his old football coaches. He said, you know, Coach Jordan, Shug Jordan. He said, uh, you were the one that made me do this, made me suffer, made me, the, made me better than myself, went beyond myself. Come back to me now in this moment when I'm trying to save myself. And, and he is, those old coaches come alive and they and the old players come alive the old wing back comes alive and it excited me so much i remember i had and i didn't know you could write a poem by a coach i was in that period where i just graduated the citadel where you write poems about you know hamlet and you write you know, poems about kings of scotland and england and so i said you write and i had a coach named dave murphy and Dave had once, I got cut from a team, and I found out my father had gone around all the other teams to find this Coach Murphy. And he said, yeah, we need another player, bring him out. So I played for him, and later on he had me pitch against the team that had beat, that had cut me, and we beat him. And it was a glorious, one of those wonderful moments. And so I wrote this thing for Dickie for the first time in his class. I wrote it terribly. But I was trying to make it a poem, but, you know, with the power of uh, the bee, and it didn't have the power of anything. But he, want, he told me, he said, there's something here. Uh, you're on to something. And he, but he was intimidated. It was huge. And, you know, you're, rah, and uh, you're on to something. So I used that, I kept that, and I used the Dave Murphy poem as one of the central parts of the great Santini. And it still is one of the favorite things I've ever written. Because once I had gotten out of that class, once he told me I was onto something, I could then find a place for it that was perfect. 
And that was because Dickie was such a good teacher. So, Big Jim Dickey up there looking down on us now approved of that passage. He would say, that's the stuff. When you consider all the rest of Pat Conroy's canon, all the other passages, all the other books, what else would Big Jim Dickey look down on and say, yeah, that's the you stuff. Know, I'm not sure. You know, Jim was so, um, Jim was my first look as an, Amer an American writer. And so I looked at him, and I, and there was stuff that you know Jim did that is is not like me, and stuff that I learned from Jim. When I was in his class, Deliverance was coming, and I thought you know the fame he got, and I watched fame come into his life, so suddenly. So, um, and you know I thought Jim took it to heart. You know I thought you need to be more careful of this. You know, this is a rattlesnake. You need to watch this. And I think Jim was hurt by that in some way. And I'm always, and also he was so competitive. I've never, you know, outside of the athletics, I've never met anyone that competitive with other writers, with, you know, other men, uh, guitar players. He would be competitive with a guitar player that could play in a band in Nashville. You know, I mean, he, you know, this, I mean, it just, he could be competitive. I'm thinking, he doesn't play guitar for a living, but I would see him, <laughs> and, uh, and I, I don't know what Jim would have given me or ever given me as encouragement. He would write, we write each other periodically two or three times in our lives, and I would praise him to the sky. He would write back praising me. But I was never sure he read a word I wrote. It never, I never quite got, um, you know, that part of it. If he had actually read it, or actually, you know, just thought, you know, and and of course, anybody that comes into Dickie's camp ever is not ever going to feel worthy of writing with him as their mentor. I think, you know, that was the way I always felt. Well, I can assure you that James Dickey did read your stuff. I was at the house on a number of occasions when he was getting older and more infirm and newspaper and magazine and other reporters would come and take pictures and he was surrounded in his big chair with all of the books and he would always, before there was a photo shoot, say, now wait a minute, wait a minute, and he would make sure that there was a current volume of Conroy somewhere so nice. in that photograph. He always thought about you. All right, let's turn from Dickie a minute and let me ask you this. What was your favorite book at age seven or so? There okay, age seven. You know, I imagine, I think I'd gotten into the Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew by age seven. I remember my sister and I had a um, competition going. My sister, my sister Carol, is a year and a half younger and but very precocious. God, she was such a precocious reader, speaker, communicator. Um, and we had a contest. Who could read all the Hardy Boys and all Nancy Drew faster? Carol always won. You know, she always, you know, we go through and Oh, you're still reading that, and, uh, but you know that, that was who when I was young. I remember those young mysteries, and then there were also books on sports heroes, revolutionary heroes. Those, you know, uh, Nathan Hale, and where I pray that I could someday, you know, be killed for my country, uh, but just have one life to give. I always loved that kind of stuff, and you know, so I read you know pretty normal stuff. My mother had read me when I was five, and then continued to read Gone with the Wind, which was her favorite novel. And that was the book she read to me and Carol, where I figured out for the first time, this is an important lesson for a writer, of learning, as she would say, you know, now, Scarlet O'Hare, now Pat and Carol, you're gonna, when I read you about Miss Scarlet, you're gonna be reminded very much of your own mother. And you know, Mama had a kind of glamour, and uh, 
pixelated view of the world that the southern woman is so famous in having. You know, so mom would tell us all this and read, and dad was Rhett Butler, mm -hmm. and Aunt Helen was tacky Melanie, and uh, she just tacky like Melanie. And, uh, and Uncle Russ was like, um, or Uncle Joe. I mean, the, she had everybody lined up in that book, like somebody in the family. And I later thought that was my first introduction to the fact that there's a relationship between life and art. Uh, if you can have, uh, that's like me, your mother, ah. And it, it certainly has proven true in my own life. God bless my mother and father's life. All right, that was age seven. Here we come up on 7D. What's Pat Conroy's favorite book at age 70? At age 70? You know, I read a book called Untying the Moon, just the other night. <laughs> and it aroused me. It was emotionally powerful. It was devastating. It was written by a young woman from Ridgeland, South Carolina, Ella Malfris. And Untying the Moon, you know, the reading of Shakespeare, Proust, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, George Eliot, Emily Dickinson had not prepared me for the power. And, <clears throat> you know, absolute. You know, her ability to bring out what was the best and most important in life and life itself until I read Ella Malfus. Uh, I was an empty shell. So at 70, untying the moon. And then I have to say, famous all over town and the Southern <laughs> Girl and all the books uh, my other friends have written for Story River Press. And I'm sure we can have a list of them that I can hold on my lap when you, Absolutely. When you do this uh, ridiculous interview. But well, let's talk a minute about Story River Books. What is Story River Books and how did that happen? You know, right now it is a group of books that is, it, it happened because Jonathan Haupt took over the University of South Carolina Press. And I had done stuff for the University of South Carolina Press, you know, over the years. They needed a blurb, they needed an introduction. I did, you know, a couple of things uh, for various people. But, you know, Jonathan came in and he fully and absolutely took advantage of my gentle nature and my ability not to accept a paycheck for anything I have done for the University of South Carolina Press. So he told me that he had an idea for a series of novels that he at first wanted to be based in South Carolina, and then we would expand out to Southern writing in general. And so we started this, is it Story River Press? Story River Books. Story River Books. See, I, always get, I don't even know the name of it. I'm the editor of these books. And Story River you know, runs the real Story River runs, you know, on the shore of Fripp Island, where I've had a home for, you know, 30 years. So, you know, it meant something to me, and especially the fact that publishing has become such an odd place for the novelist, such a weird market for the novelist, and it just is almost impossible for, especially Southerners, I think, to get books published by New York publishers and to be, have their books pushed. So we wanted to start a press where really great books that were not being published in New York could be published somewhere. So the Story River books, you know, came up. And so far, I think we've published about 15 books on, including yours. And I would describe their overall quality is simply excellent. Except for my best friend in high school, Bernie Shine's book, which, um, is I think almost in a criminal uh, offense we even put it out into the world. But that's sure burning the way saying me saying that. Well, let me ask you this: What would you say are the ingredients that go to make a good reader? A good reader. 
Okay, a good reader is, I think, someone who is read to early. I say that only because my mother read to me early. And my mother, what she was able to do with me is she was able to extend the passion she felt for words and language and story to me and to my sister. And I helped my other brothers and sisters. But she did it to me and I would see her get carried away with what she was reading to us. And she read, you know, you know, that seems to be the first thing. Then there seems to be, it's good to grow up in a house with books. And books that you can go to, you're not yelled at for going to. And, you know, that's a nice thing. I had a mother who always won the award for checking out the most books in the library. And she won that award, of course, she, as a family got bigger and she had seven kids, I think there were five books. Um, also, we'd all be out carrying five books, and I'd have to carry the baby's books, and Carol would have to carry Jimbo's books, and, and but I mean, with, with seven of us, and mom, you know, that was 40 books a week, or every other week going out of that library. And it was that, and we ended up, because Carol and I were voracious, we, we'd read everything that came through that thing. Mom, and then when we were fairly young kids, we were introduced to mom's favorite writers. And, you know, she would go through the people. I, I remember with great fondness, mom, uh, writers like Edna Ferber, and, you know, writers, um, who, who is, there, um, there was a chat, Thomas Chastain, or, you know, writers, you know, I have not heard of particularly since, Robert Rourke was one of her favorites. Mm -hmm. She absolutely adored Robert Rourke. And we hooked up in that until, and then here's the next thing, I think you must have great English teachers, teachers of language, history teachers, uh, the ones that get you interested in, in language, and the, it gets you curious about the story of peoples and the movement of peoples and the migrations of peoples around the world and knowing that you yourself come from a single family and you yourself part of a migration of humanity that started you know many thousands of years ago continue with you and when you make that connection between you the universe books the self i think something magical happens you have to have great teachers for that and you have to be and this may be the most important thing a willingness in a gratitude for being taught and opening your heart to whoever brings you that news of the world that books provide. So that's what goes to make a good reader. Tell is that, me is then, that pretentious enough? That was or can I make it more beautiful. pretentious if I try? Tell me about the ingredients that go to make a good writer. Okay, and this is only my opinion. Um, I always tell you, I love writers come up to me, you know, and I see them now. Of course, they remind me of me. Does that happen to you now? You know, they, 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 I'm just kind of, I want to be a writer. And uh, there was a woman I called the Napkin Girl. I think she's about 13, came up to me in Columbia a couple of years ago, and she handed me a napkin, and she said, I can't afford a book, but I want to be a writer. Um, so what do I have to do? And he's a nice little kid, pretty little kid. And so I think I gave her a book. But anyway, we started emailing each other. And, uh, and I, you know, it all these things I tell young kids. And I said, okay, read everything. Keep journals. Now, it's the day of, you know, computers and journals are not the same as when I came up. And, you know, I always, you know, kept one with, uh, we tried to buy a beautiful journal and I would never say, oh, I woke up, I had a headache. But I try to do, you know, I like observe things or hear stories or overhear conversations. And I try to write this down or ideas I'd get for poems and ideas I'd get for short stories or later for novels. And I'd write it down so I could always go back and look and see what I was thinking. 
you know, on these particular days or time. I was never very good at it. I was never relentless at it. And I've seen and met great journalists over, over my time. I was not, I could not quite pull that off, but I did it enough so I know how important it is. Then I always tell them this, okay, read everything, keep your journals, build your uh, vocabulary. You know, we have this beautiful, greatly unused language. Uh, you know, as it gets uh, Twitter with its stupid 165 characters, whatever, whatever that thing is, ridiculous. You know, and we have this gorgeous language um, that to put into a full orchestra, you know, that, that appeals to me. You know, be simple and beautiful and fresh and new but there are way, many ways to do that, many ways to approach that. Then when you write, and I always say to all writers, new, old, otherwise, go deeper. Try to go deeper. You know, what do you really think? You know, I've been trying my whole life to figure out who I was. I don't think I've come close to finding out, but I'm still, that's still the thing I'm trying to do. I try to write to find out who I am making this journey at this time and place on this earth. And, you know, I've spent my whole life trying to do that. That it's a failure, that's all right. It's the voyage out that is important. And that's another thing I learned from Dickie's class. Voyage out. Your home is a writing home. Your wife, Cassandra King, is a writer, and she has her part of the house to write in, and you have your part of the house to write in. Tell me about the perfect day at the House of Conroy. Okay, it used to be this. Sandra used to trust me more when we were first married, but she has learned to distrust me, not speak to me, and, and forget that I'm in the house. But here was my favorite day. Okay, I write by hand. And when I would, and a great day for me is five, legal pads filled with my handwriting. And this is about 320 words, usually. And I'll, if I do five, I'm happy. And I'd always put that on her steps. And sometimes when I would, you know, quit writing, go in, she would have put, and she'd always write 10 to my five because of her typewritten thing. And I used to love that exchange of, um, that was happening. I could feel her book growing, my book growing. But, you know, she has not done that lately, but it still is, I know that her work is being done and that has my work is being done. And then there's a how did it go today, which I always like those talks. I couldn't get it, I could not do it. Something is keeping me from this. I, what I wrote, it, it was lousy. I can't believe, you know, I'm, you know, that shallow. But, you know, I am, and I was today. And then, and what you hope for is you will not be tomorrow. That, you know, something will come to you where it will not happen tomorrow. And you always look for that. And that's what I think saves the writer's life. That a day of bad writing doesn't mean a life of bad writing. That, you know, there's good days, bad days, and sometimes great days where you say, my God, okay, that's what I want to say. And you have one of those days, and mm, mm, those words felt good coming out. Mmm, that's fine. I like the way it feels. And that feels good. And those are my favorite days. Excellent. All right, I'll let this be my last question for now. For now? For now. You mean this we'll friendship see. has to continue? <laughs> the Conroy treasure box. Literal, metaphorical. What are what would go? What is in the convoy treasure box? Things that you can hold in your hand, or things that you can only hold in your heart. What are the convoy treasures? This is. I have a photograph of my youngest daughter Suzanne. She just sent it to me, and I did not know it existed. And it was a picture taken in Rome, sitting on our terrace. And she must be four or five years old. And she's sitting in this beautiful blue dress and her head is up again. And I must be, I'm in, uh, I think, Bermuda shorts and dock siders and I'm sitting there and just her head 
resting on my, with me looking out, and I know what I was looking at. It's the Piazza Farnese, and looking out on the French Embassy in Rome, and looking across at the nuns working in the rose gardens across from that. I have come to love that picture. I had my stepson, Jim Ray, bring me a knife uh, from some visit he did to Turkey. Uh, I had Janice Owens, a novelist, give me a smaller little knife that I can use at the desk, and she has this little thing that I sharpen it with. There was a woman named Sylvia Peta who brought me a compass, and she lived in Seattle, Washington, and brought me this compass, and brought me this little box that, you know, you know, you can put, you know, things like paper clips and items in. It's so beautiful. It is, it's, it's utterly beautiful. I have, um, what, what else would I, uh, you know, the first Montblanc pen that I bought that I ended up writing the Prince of Tides with. Uh, that's when my typist still used to let me use, you know, when my handwriting got shriveled and cramped and witch-like. They made me switch to ballpoint pen. But you know, in my early days, I used to love the whole thing of pen and ink and filling a pen and you know, that ink splattered and the ink stained. And, uh, you know, I liked all that a lot. Uh, there's a picture of my, that I remember my mother buying of Lake Eola in Florida when we were sitting by the artist. And what was his name, Jack? Was it Jack Leonard? And this was um, 65 years ago. And it wasn't Jack Leonard, but it's close, it's something like that. But we saw him do the last water lily on a lily pad. And mom bought it and they talked and I, and it was a great moment. And she bought that, but that's the first time I realized people can paint art and you can buy it and you can hang it in your house. And I got that when mom died. And, you know, that is still something. I have a copy of the Boo, which was a copy that Colonel Cavorsi himself gave me uh, when I had written his book. We had it published ourselves. And, you know, you don't know what to say when you first write a book. You know, you don't know what to sign. Most of them say best wishes, which I did. And I thought, what a stupid thing to say in a book. And you have a good one. Uh, you know, I, I noticed that the other night. But the one that the boo wrote, and he had never done this in his life. And I saw the first book he ever signed, and it was to me. And I'd forgotten that, and not long ago when they were doing this whole thing, I went back to see that book, because I wanted to see what the boo would say to me. The first book he ever signed, first book I ever saw signed, uh, the first book I ever owned that I had written. Um, you know, it, it's a magical thing to me now. And so I opened it up and got a surprise. And what the Boo said, and you cannot do better than this, the Boo said to the lamb who made me, thanks, Nujim Kravarzi, the Boo. And I thought, okay, that's worth a whole writing career to go back and find. But that's in the treasure box. Pat, thank you for taking time out of your busy birthday celebration week to stop by and chat for a little while. We're all looking forward to Pat Conroy at 70 where throngs will gather. Ellen, you make it worse than it has to be, but I will <laughs> forgive you because I am 70 and I have seen the follies of youth and what they lead to. And with you, I hope it leads to many more books. Thank you, Patrick. I love you, and I thank you for this and so many other things. I used to love you, Ellen, <laughs> until today. <laughs> I didn't even pick on you. Mm. I've got a whole, okay, that's I, got, it. I had questions written. I was going to pick on you, and I was nice to you. You, you were nice to me? Yeah. Zach. You were a witness, that wasn't nice. <laughs>